Shana Tova, Good Yantif. As many, as you, many of you know, I grew up in St. Louis. But actually, I grew up in a, a suburb called Chesterfield in West St. Louis County that was predominantly white. But the public schools that I attended, the elementary school, the junior high, the high school, were quite diverse. In fact, 25%, I think, of my schools that I went to as a kid uh, were African American. And this is because Missouri state courts imposed uh, desegregation on schools in St. Louis and, and Kansas City. And then there was a voluntary program where African American kids from the inner cities of St. Louis can get on buses very early in the morning and come to more affluent schools in the suburbs. Justice-wise, I think this was a very positive thing. Students who lived in areas with crumbling, failing schools had the opportunity for a good, safe education. And the rest of the school, the, the white community, had the benefit of diversity learning from students with different life experiences, playing together on sports teams, getting to know the other as a real person. I know today things like this in states like Missouri are being scaled back, and I, I see this as a shame. Recently, though, one predominantly black school in St. Louis County, the, from the pre predominantly black school district called Normandy, the one where Michael Brown, the young man killed by a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri last year, he attended these schools. These schools, the Normandy School District, lost their state accreditation. The first time that's ever happened in, in my home state. So there's a state law that says when you go to a failing school, families get a choice of sending their kids to another school that's not failing, another school district but the failing school district gets to decide where to send those kids. So Normandy, the failing district, chose a district 30 miles away in another county, in St. Charles County. This school district was called Francis Howell. They, they thought that no families would take them up on this offer, but they did. And many, many families wanted to send their children to this school district far away to get on the bus very early in the morning and go away to this, uh, to this other county. The radio show, This American Life, recently did a documentary about, uh, about these school districts. Part of the radio documentary played, uh, played the, the soundtrack from a, a meeting of parents from Francis Howell. This was the, the suburban district. This was a community meeting to discuss what was going to be happening. So here are some statements that were on the radio from, from parents at, from the transcript of this meeting. One woman said, my question, she, this is addressing the school board, my question is when a child who is coming from an underperforming school with low test scores comes into a math class at Francis Howell, how will they ever possibly cope? Another woman said, so I'm hoping that their discipline records come with them, like their health records will come with them. And there was a lot of applause when, when these statements were said on, on the radio. I don't know if they edited it that way, but there was applause. Another woman compares uh, this situation to uh, the Metrolink, which, was the, which is the rapid transit system in St. Louis. So she says, years ago, when the Metrolink was very popular, St. Charles County put to a vote whether or not we wanted the Metrolink to come across into our community. And we said no. And the reason we said no is because we don't want the different areas, I'm going to be very kind, coming across on our side of the bridge, bringing with it everything that we're fighting today against. One other woman said, this is what I want to know from you. In one month, I send my three ch small children to you, and I want to know, is there any metal detectors? 
We're not talking about the Normandy School District losing their accreditation because of their buildings or their structures or their teachers. We are talking about violent behavior that is coming in with my first grader, my third grader, and my middle schooler that I'm very worried, worried about. Actually, the Normandy schools didn't lose their accreditation because of violence. They lost their accreditation because bad schools. Finally, one more woman. My husband and I both have worked and lived in underprivileged areas in our jobs. This is not a race I issue. And I want to say to, if she's even still here, the first woman who came up here and cried that it was a race issue, I'm sorry. That's her prejudice. Calling me a racist because my skin is white and I'm concerned about my children's education and safety. This is not a race issue. This is a commitment to education issue. So are these people racist? I don't know. I do hear prejudice, and I hear fear. I think that fear is the emotion that's most coming out of these statements. Fear of people from other communities. Fear of people who might have different life situations. Fear of the unknown. What the people at the public meeting, these commentators did not consider, though, is the fear that the Normandy parents had of sending their children to failing schools. Fear is a powerful emotion. It can be crippling. Fear of change, the fear of the unknown, fear of nuclear armed enemies. Fear can blind us to the other standing across from us, their needs, their wants, their opinions. Sometimes fear doesn't allow us to listen to someone else, doesn't allow us to dialogue, only causes us to argue, to debate, to fight. Could be fear of vulnerable immigrants changing our society, fear of you name it. I see a lot of words in the High Holy Day prayer book, in the Mahsor, a lot of scary words. Words that bring fear, book of life, judgment, who shall live and who shall die. These scary words, these words of fear are meant, I think, to turn our fears in life, often real fears in life, towards fear of God. Fear of God, you say? I don't literally believe in the old man in the sky who meets out punishment. So here's what I mean when I say fear of God. Yira in Hebrew. Yira often means fear or awe, A-W-E. There's a fine line between them. I want to quote from Alan Marinus, a, a contemporary Jewish teacher that I've been quoting a lot. He talks about the book of Jonah, which we'll read tomorrow afternoon. In the book, when Jonah sleeps in the hold of the boat and a great storm blows, the verse, there's a verse that tells us that the sailors in the boat had yira for the eternal one exceedingly. Yira, fear, or awe. Do you know the experience of being in the midst of a great storm? when what you feel combines awe and fear and acute awareness of the profound majesty of life? Or standing at the lip of the Grand Canyon and looking down into the beautiful gorge cut by centuries of water that falls away right before you and the beauty and immense awe you, and the beauty and immense awe you feel while the sheer drop terrifies you and your heart sings a song of praise? Those images help us understand the word yira itself and what it is pointing to. But why so much emphasis on this experience in Jewish thought and practice? Why all the fear? Why does yira lead to wisdom and happiness as the book of Kohelet, the book of Ecclesiastes says? It says that yira, fear or awe, is the whole of a person. When a human being experiences yira, 
that experience directly awakens a spiritual consciousness just as an alarm clock awakens a sleeping person. Compared to moments of gira, we may indeed be asleep much of our lives. When overtaken by gira, we experience a tremendous spiritual reality that is ordinarily hidden from us. Yira gives us a direct experience of the transcendent in that very moment, pointing our hearts directly to the divine presence. Through the extraordinary experience that, experiences that generate Yira, you become acquainted with the spiritual charge that is available to you every moment of the day. If you undertake to grow that experience in you, as you become more adept at finding Yira, you will find it rising in you not only in extraordinary situations like birth and death, great mammals and kaleidoscope sunsets, but in a cup of tea, a flower, the flow of traffic, the ability to hear, and almost anywhere. One who experiences the divine presence as it infuses this moment has had a great glimpse of the foundation of Jewish thought and practice and so Yura gives us the strongest insight we can have into what these words, these worlds are all about. No wonder it is called the whole of a person. If we can turn our fear into awe. If we can turn our fear of the unknown, our fear of, of change, our fear of life into awe. Yira can be fear or awe. We need to elevate our fear. <clears throat> Yira leads to bitachon and emunah, trust and faith in God. There's a poem we'll read before the Kaddish tonight, before the mourner's Kaddish, that says, from fear to faith. Here's a teaching by Rabbi Yechiel Yitzhak Per from a parable from the Vilna Gaon, a great, ninth, uh, great 18th century sage about faith and trust. A king once had a ladder put against a wall, and he said that whoever mounted the ladder to the top would get his daughter in marriage. Of course, all the soldiers were vying to be the first to run up the ladder. The first, one, the first one was two-thirds up, and when he hit the next step, it just opened up, and he fell through. The step snapped closed again, and now the rest of them weren't running quite so fast. The second guy went up a little more hesitantly, and as he stepped gingerly on that step, the same thing happened. It opened up, he fell through, and then it snapped shut again. So now no one wanted to try until finally a fellow came along who ran very quickly up the ladder with a lot of power. And when he came to that step, he jumped with all his might to the rung above it, and he landed safely. It didn't, it didn't open up, and he received the daughter in marriage. The rabbi teaches, this parable tells us that although the king has made a trick step, he is seeking the one who trusts him enough to know that he's not just out to break everybody's leg. He's the one, he, he's the, one the king wants for a son-in-law. Of course, it's a tricky thing to do. So the rabbi student asks him, the next rung could have been booby-trapped too. Yeah, Rabbi Pear quickly responded, but not likely. The one who jumped, he figured out that the next step was going to be solid. How did he know that? because he trusted that, in the end, the king didn't want to break everybody's neck. Many might fall, but the trick rung was there only to reveal who was going to be the one who would conquer. Trust. Life sometimes can be hard. It's full of fears. But we have to trust Trust in God, trust in ourselves, trust in our loved ones, trust in society sometimes, that we could take the next step or jump up above a step on a ladder. But is faith and trust only about taking that leap? 
So back to Alan Marinus, who teaches in his book Everyday Holiness about the 20th century sage Le Chazonish, who writes, saying that the obligation to make an effort is limited to deeds that stand a chance of success. Acts of desperation, on the other hand, are unacceptable and are a contradiction to faith. In other words, reliance on miracle is taken to be, con to be contrary to a life of faith. And indeed, many commentators advise us that we, are not that we are not to live our lives reliant on God's miracles, especially where our capabilities are available to help. Your obligation is to act, not to determine the outcome. Once you have made all the efforts you can, don't torture yourself over the results. You can and you should take action. And then you hold in mind that the ultimate outcome is in the hands of God not you. Of course, we have choices in life. Choices to confront our fears. Choices every, every minute, every second, we make choices. But we're also not totally free. On our back, we have our genetics. We have the circumstances of everything else happening around us, all the people, the weather. We're in control and yet we have no control. That's what faith is. That's what trust is, is able to move forward, to continue to make those choices without fear, to make those choices in awe of the world and God's power, to make those choices with trust and faith. A psalm that is read at this season of the year leading up to the High Holy Days, Psalm 27, ends with this line, Kve el Adonai, hope in the eternal. Be strong and courageous. Hope in the eternal. Fear constricts us. Yura, as awe, opens us up to the world. Emunah and bitachon, trust and faith, will help us go forward. Beginning a new year can be a time of anxiety and fear. I pray that we hope, that we're strong, that we're courageous, that we move forward individually and together. Shana Tovah.